Welcome to the Reach the Stars podcast, a collection of conversations with cool people who do cool things. Brought to you by Papercraft Miracles. Each week, we'll bring you inspiring stories of persistence, passion, and purpose. With your host, Jonna Willoughby Lore. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Reach the Stars podcast. I am your host, Jonna Willoughby Lore. Today, my guest is Jennifer Etchigary. And she is kind of the guru of all things artificial intelligence and virtual reality and uh, the business that she's working in right now. So I'm going to let her tell you a little bit more about that. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. This is exciting. I, I love the idea of being able to talk to cool people, do cool things. What a great concept. Exactly. It's really fun. So tell us a little bit more about you and your and your story. How'd you get where you are and, and what is it exactly that you do? Sure. Um, so I am a emerging technology consultant. And so when I can define emerging tech, it's kind of anything like you had said earlier, artificial intelligence, uh, chatbots, so conversational AI, um, augmented reality, virtual reality. So there's a lot of um, cool applications that are available. And um, I help kind of connect um, vendors and businesses so they can quickly get their projects started. Um, it didn't, I, I, my story didn't always start like this. Uh, I wasn't in emerging tech. I actually come from a very, uh, analyst, uh, finance background. That's what I took in school and, um, through working through a, quite a few corporate jobs, I discovered that, um, I am not a good employee. So, uh, <laughs> hence, um, you know, I, entrepreneurship's kind of always been in the cards for me and it's always been this burning little fire and, it's taken me a few years to get, I guess, enough confidence and um, I guess just gumption to go for it. And ever since uh, starting the Chat C group, um, it's been an amazing adventure and I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. I would never go back to um, a corporate job again. <laughs> so where, where are you located? Right now, um, I'm located just outside Montreal, um, Quebec, but uh, we also have an office in Toronto and in Vancouver. Cool. Yeah. Hey, not too far from me. Well, no. too far because I'm in Buffalo. Oh, yeah. Super close. Yeah. So between working in finance, um, how did you end up getting into doing like virtual reality and, and stuff like that? Like, yeah, it's there's really no con from connection standpoint. But I, I find um, ever since I was young, I was kind of obsessed with um, trends and what was always happening in the future and what could happen and what could make things more efficient or better or just a better employee or user experience. And so you could most likely find me always Googling like, what's the next food trend or what's, I'm a huge foodie as well. Um, what's the next um, uh, corporate trend that's gonna help employees do this in HR or, so I was always trying to understand that and, um, and I also began a very analytical background. So always trying to make sure and put the numbers together. So, um, that's kind of how I got into more augmented reality, virtuality and chatbots because I just found those applications to be fascinating and fun. And then I always was trying to, I guess, marry the corporate side of me with those new trends. And so that's kind of how the Chatsy group uh, started. Cool. Yeah. So, do you actually like do all the technology part yourself or are you kind of like the middleman in between like the people who are making all that stuff happen and the people who need it? Are you like, yeah, great question. Um, so I am definitely the middle woman. I am a connector of all things. I think, um, I got asked early on in my career, like to always ask yourself why you're doing this, Jen, why are you waking up in the morning? Don't just start a company, just, you know, have a company. And, um, as I started the chassis group and I always kind of had that in the back of my head, why, um, I really enjoy connecting people at the end of the day. I love seeing, um, somebody have a great idea or a great use case or case study. And then I can connect them with that skilled talent, whether they're located in, you know, the Ukraine or they're located in Germany or they're located in Niagara Falls, Canada or, or Buffalo. <laughs> um, I just love making those marriages happen and then just seeing and collaborating and having that project management oversight. So I get to kind of see the success to the end. Um, that's really what drives me to do what I do. That's awesome. Yeah. So how long ago did you start your company? 
it's been over a couple of years now. Um, it started off as um, a chatbot, mostly just chatbot consulting. And then um, I was getting a lot of inquiries to be like, well, Jen, you know, we're into conversational AI. We're getting the chatbot implemented, but we really want to digitalize a conference as well. Do you have any vendors in your repertoire that you can connect us with. And so as is, again, as I started to talk to more and more senior leaders, I recognized like they were kind of just looking at me as this tech girl, right? It's like, okay, well, she connected us with this. So can maybe she can connect us with that. And so um, that's kind of how I added kind of a few more, um, I guess, expertises underneath me. And I've been able to connect again with just, I think the top, we have about 40 plus vendors with us that are just I'd say the top of the top from around the world that uh, we work quite closely with. So I've been able to get just develop some amazing relationships with some great, like forward thinking people. Cool. That's yeah. A- um, so I'm curious how, how has the pandemic affected your business? Um, well, my team is remote. So from a, I guess an in-business point of view, it didn't affect me at all. Um, if anything, um, it's accelerated every, everything, right? Everybody now wants to be, I have some type of automation with everybody working remote communication, employee engagement, everything is different. And so my business like basically exploded, I would say starting May last year. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's been, it's been busy, but it's been a fun ride. <laughs> and it's been, it's been an interesting balancing act too, because I've also high, I also um, have two children. And so that's been, a, you know, just like all mothers out there, just trying to survive and make sure that everybody is, you know, I'm facilitating the learning. I'm trying to make sure, uh, you know, everybody's eating healthy. I'm trying to like make sure my business is running. So it's been a fun balancing act between that as well. <laughs> I hear you on that. How old are your kids? Yeah. My kids are going to be six and eight this year. So, so yeah, so I, um, I'm, I was a, a young, a young mom. I had kids when I, I think my son was about, yeah, I was 24 when I had my son. So, um, I guess maybe I can tell you a little bit, if you don't mind, I can kind of tell you a little bit about my Go for it. past a little bit. Um, so I, uh, had, like I said, I had my son, I was 24. So I, none of my friends had kids at, I well, still, my friends don't have kids at this age, which is like totally cool. And, and so I didn't really have, um, any resources or anything like, like that. And I think that's kind of where that entrepreneurial thing kind of started was because I started to get into just, I was at home, I had this baby and I was like, how, how can I make business? I was bored. And I was, I was always kind of trying to find a bit of a purpose at home. Cause I just couldn't resonate with anything else around me or relate to anybody else. So, um, I was working corporate, um, uh, in uh, mutual fund sales. And I also worked at a big uh, financial institution and, um, I went back after my first and I was like, Oh, after a year off and Matt leave, you're just, everything just, I think just shifts, right. You get a bit of that freedom and a bit of an idea of being able to lay out your own day. And, um, then I had a really tough time for that couple of years, uh, in corporate because of just that freedom. <laughs> <Matt Lee. laughs> it's funny. Cause since you're in Canada, like you're like, Oh, I got to have a whole year off when I had a baby. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't happen here in the States. Like <laughs> if you're going to take a whole year off, like you better have saved for like five years in order to do it because yeah, I got so six weeks paid, but it wasn't even my full paycheck. I got six weeks where I made like 50 per 55% of what I was making at my job. And then I had, I was able to take six more weeks with no pay at all. Um, before I had that, to go back to my job. That is so challenging. I couldn't even imagine because your kids are so young at that point. I know I def- would definitely say we are very privileged and lucky in Canada to have the, that. And I think even Trudeau, this is after my kids, I'm not 100% sure, but he, I think, extended Matt Leap to almost being 18 months or something like Yeah, wild. I know. Yeah. It's, it's so crazy, like, what the United States expects of mothers in general to be like, Oh, well, you know, you better have a lot of money saved. And, you know, (laughs) you're like, and a ton of money saved at 24. Like, am I like, Nope. Like I, nobody, I had nothing organized. I exactly. And if you can't afford housing and and I'm not sure what childcare is like in the States, but childcare here, it was like another mortgage. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, like if you're lucky to find a spot in a daycare, yeah. You know, $50 a day at least is like the cheapest you're going to get. And 
So you better be making at least that much at your job. <laughs> Otherwise yeah. it's not yeah. worth it. And exactly. so, and I was really lucky to have a job that gave me six weeks paid and then let me take another six weeks unpaid after that, because most people who I know who had had kids had to fight for that first six weeks in the first place. And it was really unlikely that their job was still going to be there when they came back. Oh, that's so, that's so disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. That is a challenge because yeah. How, how can you, I can't even, those first three months of having a kid, they're like a blur. It's like a tunnel that you just, I, I, I remember actually the first three months being like, you get through the first three months or four months, like it kind of gets better because they start sleeping a little bit more regularly and feeding is a little bit more regular, but those first few months, it's like, <laughs> especially as a first time mom, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It was crazy. And I ended up, um, before I took my leave, I talked to my job and I was like, look, you know, once I'm going to want to take another three, you know, I want to take three full months off. And then once I come back, I want to do part-time in the office and part-time from home. This is like 2015, 2016. And so I was like, I'll buy the same computer that I have at work so I can do, cause I was editing photos. So I was like, I needed to have okay. like a high power graphics computer to run all Adobe programs and stuff like that. So I was like, I'll have this, I'll buy, I'll put out my own money to like buy the computer and get the programs and do that and like set it up at home. And like twice a week I'll come in the office and like bring my work in that I did and I'll get more, you know, raw photos from you, take them home and edit them and then bring them back. And I'd been working there for like five years at this point. So they were like, okay, I guess we'll try it. And after a couple months of doing that, um, working from home, I was like, I hate this. <laughs> like I was editing photos of jewelry. My kids are going to come in here right now. <laughs> Hi, bud. I'm recording. Can you go back upstairs? No, but uh, oh. I coming back here for <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Are you coming to say hi to mom? <laughs> I know you make weird faces on the video. What do you need, baby? Mm, I don't need room, but... <laughs> yeah, I don't remember why you came down here? <laughs> Just to say hi. Nice to see you. Okay, think real hard about why you came down here. What were you going to ask me? <laughs> oh, I need the vacuum. Oh, you need the vacuum cleaner? Okay, hold on one second. <laughs> I need to back out. Okay, hold on. Um, so yeah, I was working part-time at home and then part-time in the office. And after a couple months, the other people who worked at my job started complaining to my boss that I was never there. And when I was there, I was like never at my desk because I was pumping milk at work, which is the most fun thing ever. Oh my God. And they ended up saying to me like, okay, well even though we know that you do a good job and you're doing enough work and other people are complaining. So you have to either come back full time or figure something else out. And oh I talked to my husband and I was like, well, they're not paying me enough for us to afford daycare. If I go back to work full time, I would give them all of my money for daycare and healthcare and come home with nothing and yeah. pay us to raise our kid. And so he was like, well, that doesn't make sense. So just stay home and do your book thing. <laughs> Cause I'd had this like side side gig hustle since college, making crafts and making stuff out of paper for people. And I'd wanted to do that full time forever, but it was really hard to be able to do that without capital and all that stuff. So he was like, yeah, just stay home and do your book thing. So I ended up quitting my job in the beginning of 2016 to stay home and do my book thing. And it ended up being so crazy, but look what happened. I know. Like I, knowing how it wasn't that difficult for us to like tighten the straps a little bit to make that happen. I was like, man, why didn't I do that? Like years ago. And like, I wish I had, it's like the one thing I wish I'd done for sure. I know. I know it takes kind of that, you know, at that moment where you're like, do I go to like, is this worth it or not? Right. Like, do I go to this work and struggle away and not bring that much like to pay for daycare and stuff versus starting your own and just doing it and scary, but you did it and it's, it's worth it. Now you can kind of manage both. And I think, I think COVID's actually probably brought out a, that it's just, I think accelerated that for, for everybody. Right. Just kind of like, do oh, I like working from home? Do I want to go back to work once COVID is over? I know my, 
I know a bunch of corporations we work with, they're doing a lot of employee surveys right now to be like, do you want to stay at home? Do you want to come here at work? And everyone, more or less, I feel like everybody likes a little bit of a hybrid, but I don't know if that will be allowed because just like you said, if certain people who are maybe 21, 22, don't have kids or people don't have kids are at the office every day, and then they don't, then they don't see you at the office every day and you're going to miss those conversations. Or are you going to feel left out? Is it going to create a negative mm-hmm. working space? So they have a lot of poor HR. They have a lot of different <laughs> conversations and decisions to make. Yeah. About, yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting because in, in my business, we make everything by hand. So like I need to have my staff here. There's a few things they can do from home. But for the most part, I mean, aside from my video editor and graphic designer type, you know, like my contractors, my my actual assistants to work in the office, like I need them to be here. And um, it definitely like lends to a lot of the fun of what we do that we get to have like this team of all these artisans kind of like sitting around together and making stuff and learning how to do new things together and we do a lot of custom orders so kind of like every day is totally different it's like what are we doing today like we're trying to figure out this crazy problem you know figure out a solution to this so that we can make this weird project for whoever the client is and it's been really crazy um as far as like being a mother during COVID anyway, is like, I find it so difficult that there's just so many things that are expected of moms that I'm, I'm finding are not as expected of dads. Uh, oh. And even pre COVID, it was like that too, but it's just like, even little things <laughs> like I have an opportunity to go um, record a show potentially um, in LA for like a week. And somebody said to my husband like oh are you ready to be the stay-at-home dad while she goes to do that and i'm like um he has a job like he goes out of town for weeks at a time and like nobody says oh good for you for holding down the fort while he's gone i'm like what is it why does he get bonus points because like i get to go do something i love for a week for my job like what is that like I know. I know. It's like they put, and I hate to say this because I'm sure both like our, both of our husbands are great guys, but it's like, they kind of put them on a bit of a pedestal. Like, Oh, you took the kids for a couple hours. Well, she did this. And now you're like, yeah, like course, right? Like you have to support each other. I, yeah, uh, it's, it's a, it's been an interesting thing uh, for sure. But I also think it's good for like my husband, and I both have been working from home and now he's kind of been able to help with lunches and help with the things. And he also, I guess, to see all of the, I guess, behind the scenes work that moms do and are in charge of. And it's, I think, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a humbling experience. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like right in the beginning of the pandemic, my husband's company was closed where he works and he was getting unemployment. And my stepmom comes to watch the kids a couple days a week. And so he was being paid to not go to work and he had her three days a week. And I was like, okay, well, I'm trying to keep my company afloat. My main assistant had gotten another job. So it was just me. And I was getting all of these orders coming in because people really wanted to find a way to be connected and to send special gifts to people. And all the flower shops were closed and we make paper flowers. So we were making like tons of flowers for funerals and stuff like that. But really it was like me, I was making them all by myself. <laughs> yes. I had no staff and I couldn't have people here because our state was shut down and it was so crazy. And I was working 12, 14 hours a day, every day. And he kept messaging like, Hey, what's for dinner? I'm like, you tell me what's for dinner. Like you are being paid to not work right now. And you have three days of help. Like, I don't want to hear nothing from you. Like what? And he was just like, Oh, you're not going to like do all that stuff you were doing before. I'm like, no, no, right now I'm the breadwinner and you're collecting unemployment. So he did get a taste of that for like the first month. And yeah. It's crazy that like moms are expected to like give up your work time to do school with the kids and people are like, Oh, just put them in front of the iPad. You know, like my kid, is, my oldest is five. Like he's not going to sit and do virtual kindergarten without someone facilitating that with him. Yeah. It's so it's so crazy that like, I know that in the last quarter in the U S all of the jobs that were lost were jobs that were women's jobs. Every single one of them. And I'm like, that is such a shame that there's so many women who have to like give up their jobs and give up their careers to take care of kids. I know. And it's all, and with all of these movements, like, you know, we're really trying to promote females in the workplace and all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, it's great to put 
you know, females in more leadership positions, but you also have to put them in, like, you have to also help them with the support that's involved in that. Right. Like exactly. how could you do all that without the extra help? How could you do all that? Especially if your husband is working another full-time job, like it, it's, and then you're always kind of trying, you're taking that on yourself. Like, well, if I'm taking this extra position. I'm taking this extra job. Sure. I get a raise, but I still like the, the, the housework and the kids stuff doesn't stop. Exactly. Right? Especially, it, it's still there. And we have, like, I, we don't live close to any um, close family or anything like that. And so it's been a lot of it kind of expected of, of me at the beginning. And I think my husband and I had a pretty tough chat within about the first month of COVID. And I said, I'm, I'm drowning. Right. Cause my job just kind of like you, mine accelerated like crazy. And so then I was like, Oh my gosh, like, how am I going to handle all of this? Plus trying to get the kids organized and food and all of it. Right. And yeah. yeah. I'm going to need help, honey. You gotta, you gotta help. And so it's been, it's been good. You know, we're a year uh, into it and it's all okay. It's all good. But at the beginning it was pretty tough, but yes, yeah. I imagine it's, it's sad that all of these jobs are lost and predominantly women and it's going to take years upon year, decades to kind of get that back up to parity. I know it's so crazy. I mean, yeah. it- I'm super, super lucky to have my business be something that did not only survive, but has been growing like crazy since COVID. We tripled our revenue last year. Like it was crazy. That's amazing. I love hearing like that success, you know, and being able to do all that while being a mom and during COVID, like it's such a huge feat. And I think moms don't pat themselves on the back as much as we should. Right. It's, It's a lot. It's yeah, a, it's a lot. As as women in general, I mean, for for women to congratulate themselves and each other and and be confident and feel good about working hard for something that they love is so like kind of taboo for yeah. women to do that. It's like, oh, you and it's like the the mom guilt struggle is so real to be like, okay, well, I really want to do this for me and that people can really judge you like, Oh, if you're a, uh, if you're a working mom, then you're also a crap mom. Cause you're not a hundred percent devoted to your kids every second. And you're not hand sewing all the Halloween costumes and making the gluten-free freaking cupcakes and all, all, like, all of that stuff that's expected of you um, that you're supposed to do all that and cook and clean and make tons of money and somehow manage to do all of it. And like also look good at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And like, oh wait, you also, you can't, you can't be fat, but you can't be too skinny. Cause then people will hate you and uh, you better have nice, nice, like straight teeth and you better have like nice hair and like whatever. All of that is like expected of moms and like dad guilt's not real. Like nobody makes dads feel like crap for going to work for 40 hours a week. They're like, oh, good for you for providing for your family, you know, and that like, all, all of the labor that women do is like, not only most of it is not paid, but it's not even noticed that we even do it. And no. that just drives it's, me insane. It's that emotional labor that just kind of doesn't get mm-hmm. credit, so to speak. And it's funny, like we, um, we're part of like a hockey community. My son plays hockey. And so there's the hockey moms are pretty close and we've, we all talk about this too, right? It's all the emotional labor that's involved with just kids. And then the house that just goes on completely unnoticed, especially like, like my husband works at a pretty high performing job and, um, you know, he is busy, he does work a lot, but at the same time, I'm also working a lot, right. I'm over, same as you, like I'm working amount of hours and it's just like, I'm working in a male dominated industry as well. Mm-hmm. And so that also plays an interesting, interesting thing because I, it's interesting. I was just rebranding my website right now and my marketing director wants to put female founder on it. And I'm just like, I can't, I can't put female founder on that because, um, it just rubs men the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my prospects and just people that I deal with from the vendor side are all men. Right. And it's like this funny phenomenon. We're trying to celebrate like female founders and girl bosses and all of that. But then it really, really rubs off the men the wrong way. They're like, well, we don't get to do that and stuff. I'm like, yeah, because you don't, you don't have to deal with all the stuff that we deal with. And that's why we get to like have that credit. <laughs> it's like, exactly. you don't. Right. But they're just like, well, you're just a founder. And so I, it's, it's interesting. I'm going through this argument right now with my marketing director. And I'm like, I think I can only just put founder. I can't put female founder even though it would 
amplify and I get all of the female support and women owned businesses. It's, I just, I can't. It's yeah. Weird. I mean, yeah. I guess in, in my industry, because I have like a, a craft business that, um, I guess typically what I do would be, would be done by women anyway. Um, but it's really been interesting. Like when I was going to in-person networking events pre COVID, I did so many women's networking events for years with other women business owners. And I was like, man, this is so great. Everybody's like working together and we want to collaborate and support each other and like share resources and stuff like that. And then I went to this, co-ed networking event the first time in like a year or so right before everything shut down for COVID. And I, I was talking to this guy and I was like, yeah, this is my company and this is what I do. Everything we do is handmade. And his only response to me was like, well, you're never going to be able to make a profit if you make everything by hand. <gasps> and I looked at him like, I've made a profit every year. I've been in business since I was 22 years old. So you, you can bite me, dude. Yeah. your negativity up out of my face like what yeah. and it's so i like it it snuck up on me because i was like oh yeah that's why i don't go to these <laughs> never mind <laughs> out of here you know i was like I've, I've had enough of like dudes believing that you can't do it and like trying to tell mansplain you into thinking that you you can't succeed and or that you haven't already succeeded you know like without even listening to your story to find out that yes indeed you can do this and i have and i could probably teach you something and you know it's just it's so crazy this male dominated world where you can't even say like by the way not only I, like i think it's i wish that you could put female foundings you're like above everything else like yes i did all this and i'm taking care of my kids and i struggled against this totally male dominated field to succeed in ways that men have not been able to and that it's another thing of mental labor that you have to like spend time debating whether or not it's going to hurt your company to advertise the fact that you worked your ass off like that sucks so bad that it the sucks. world like that it's like, yeah, you, you nailed it right there. It's, it's like this constant thing because I get, I get asked to do, um, you know, different like from women entrepreneurs, especially women in tech. It's such like a, a hashtag <laughs> we'll call it. Right. Yeah. And so I get a lot of interviews or just different things to be like, Hey, Jen, explain your female story and stuff. And I, I have to constantly kind of decline because I, I have to, I have to balance that image marketing wise. Cause I can't just go full force into like, I'm a woman entrepreneur and this is what I'm able to do and all that, because it really, again, it really deflects a lot of the men. There's like, no, I'm, I'm turned off like by that. Like you're, you're just an entrepreneur. Like, why are you doing like, why do you, do, why are you leveraging all of these women things? We don't have that. We don't have men in tech. We don't have, I'm just like, yep, yeah, but like, it's very well, that's, different. That's the giving. Like, <laughs> Yeah. No one yeah. Is you have your like bros. <laughs> no one's gonna, like look at the name of a company and ever assume that it's female founded. You know what I mean? It's like everybody assumes that it's male founded till they find out that it's not. And they're like, Oh wait, that's surprising or whatever. And you know, just having women in places of power typically makes men really uncomfortable. And, and that's the thing you're like, do I, is it, it cause I make you feel uncomfortable. Like I have to put myself down. Like, is that, is that the right thing here? No, yeah. but at the same time, right. It's like, I, I have to be sensitive to my market, my niche and who I'm with. So it's a, it's an interesting marketing balancing act, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I saw this, this thing that said, um, this, female founder was saying that someone said to her, Oh, you're so intimidating. And she goes, am I intimidating or are you intimidated? It's got nothing to do with me. You know, like it's just you doing your thing. So I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about like the, the hustle of being an entrepreneur and like what it's taken you to get where you are um, right now. Yeah. So, um, I think I was going to say, I think there's two sides to this hustle. I think, um, one side of my hustle is definitely, um, when I get a right interview, it's more glorified, um, because I think it's what you maybe see in the movies or you kind of just associate with the hustle. So this is a true story. So it's a, it's a good one. Um, so I originally went to school uh, in Calgary. So that's where I got my, uh, my commerce degree from. And it was always been a dream of mine, especially being in finance to move to the financial Mecca of Canada, which would be Toronto. 
And so I knew nobody here. I didn't have any connections. Um, my husband was just my boyfriend at the time. And I was really determined uh, to get here regardless if he wanted to or not. Um, and so one, one, uh, one random night in Vegas, we were visiting there for a few days. We were up in this really nice hotel overlooking, you know, the strip and you know, we were living in Calgary, which is a beautiful city, but it just, it wasn't Toronto. And, um, and I said, you know what, like this resonates with me. I want to be in the busyness. I need to go. And I think at that point he agreed with me. And so we sold, I think within five weeks, I sold every single thing in our little apartment in Calgary. Uh, we packed every, like all of my belongings, all of our belongings into about six hockey bags, uh, that we bought from Canadian tire and then later returned because we needed the money. <laughs> And, um, we took, I had two dogs at the time and our two cats. So it was like quite the little, um, zoo. We took a, took a one-way ticket over to Toronto and, um, we couldn't afford like that much. And so we slept on an air mattress for, I think nine months. I did that. I hustled. I went and dropped my resume off at a tons of different bars and pubs and just to get something, um, immediately. And he ended up getting a job at a financial institution, which was his background. And then later, um, I kind of prospected and, you know, networked my way into another financial institution as well. So it took about three or four months to get there, but, um, it's been, it was quite, quite the hustle to kind of get to that spot. And then, um, get pregnant with a, with the child. And then that's actually when I found the hustle really started as much as that initial hustle was exciting and fun. And it's a cool story to tell. And it was a hard time in my life because we had no money and it was very, to be very resourceful. I actually found as soon as I became pregnant and again, really young and didn't really have much going for me. That's kind of when I, I really had to hustle, so to speak, right. Mm -hmm. Still working jobs, still being a mom, still not having the resources, still having to do it all. But, um, it's funny. I, I tried to save, depending on what interview I'm at or what kind of what the journalist reporter needs, I go to either hustle to kind of resonate with their audience more. And it shouldn't be like that. That's the thing. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's been, a, it's been a good journey. And, you know, I, I look back on it and I'm super grateful for all of the challenges and the overcoming kind of nature of me. Cause I think that's the biggest thing about being an entrepreneur is, you know, you're going to have days where it just kicks your ass and you're just like, Oh my God, like, am I in the right thing? Like, like am I going to die from this at an early age? Right. Cause of all of the stress and anxiety and just big decisions that you have to make. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think it was those, those initial, I think five or six years of the hustle and trying to get there that really kind of made me harder and, and stronger, um, to push through, um, uh, building the Chatsy group. So it's been a good, been a good ride. And I'm really excited that, um, being in emerging tech and being a female. And, um, I think I just have to kind of grow up and own it a little bit more and not care as much about what people think. And I think that's just part of me needing to grow and feel more comfortable. Awesome. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. You know, we're all going to get there. <laughs> we're all going to get there eventually. You know, it, it has been really nice kind of heartening, I guess, in the last five years to just see the way that there's, there's certain things out in the world now that are just like not okay anymore to yeah. do, you know, and like it kind of snuck up on us. We're like, oh man, like it's not okay to like treat women like crap in the workplace. You are going to get called out for it. It is going to follow you around forever. Like someone is going to film you and you are going to get called yeah. out for it. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, you know, I think that's my favorite thing that's come about because of smartphones, which are like documents of things that are not yeah. and, and that the, the, the regular person on the street could make a real big difference by recording something and saying, yeah, you want to say that doesn't happen? I have proof it does. Um, yeah. it's really that's cool. actually a very good point. Awesome. So at the end of all of the shows, I asked all the guests the same five questions. So it's five question time. Okay. The first question is, tell me about an experience that shaped who you are today. My parents divorce for sure. Uh, my parents got divorced and I was just, I guess in my first year university, so I was about 19 and uh, my mom moved away with my brother and I stayed uh, in Calgary to finish my degree with my dad. 
And, uh, you know, other than the emotional stress that happened, um, it really made me grow up quick because I didn't have that parental support. And so I had to be independent right away. And, um, I think just, again, from a challenge and overcoming perspective that changed a lot, uh, for me, just kind of like I'm on my own and I can do this. So, okay. yeah. It's interesting because my, my family structure is so crazy. My parents were married to other people when I was born. So like my whole, my whole exist, like everyone, all of my parents who've been involved in my life have all been divorced at least once before I was born. And like, I, I was like, came out of all of these failed relationships with like people like making up and breaking up and getting married to other people. And so I had five parents my whole life and it's, it's just always been so interesting. I kind of got to live like three different, three different lives and three yeah. different every single week. All the and, dynamics. Uh, you know, when somebody's <laughs> like, one family's a lot of dynamic, let alone three. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really weird for me. Like I don't I don't quite know how to properly live only in one family, and it's definitely something that I struggle with. Um, but I think that in, in a lot of ways, for for people who haven't had that experience, um, hearing about the fact that because I got to learn from all these different adults, it like helped me a lot as growing up because I got to say like, okay, well those that relationship didn't work because of this. And I learned these skills from this parent and these skills from this other parent. So I got to like, I got to learn from a lot of different adults. So it, it kind of helps me feel alleviated on my mom guilt a little bit when my kids are spending a lot of time with people that are not me while I'm working that I'm like, Oh, they're, they're learning from all these other adults who were teaching them things that I might not know. So it's, it's interesting. It takes a village, right? That is the definition. And I, it's so funny you say that because I'm, I'm not the softest mom, right? I, I think I'm I, being, an I just, I'm definitely not, but I think, you know, I, I kind of was used to be hard on myself about that, but I'm like, well, wait, like, no, like my, my, my best friend who is the softest person in the world. And my friend, you know, they go hang out with her kids all the time. Like my daughter gets to do that and same with her teacher and stuff. Like there's so many different women influences that maybe have that softer side that she can learn from. And I have more of that like personality, which is also good and bad and other things too. Right. So it's, it takes a lot of different people. And I think that's the coolest thing about exposing your children to actually a lot of great environments. It's they, yeah. hopefully they take the good from it. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, so number two, when you feel defeated or overcome, what do you tell yourself to keep going? That's a great question. Um, if I feel defeated or overcome, I think usually when that happens, it's usually when I start to overcomplicate things or I start to be a bit hard on myself and I feel like I need to kind of, you know, keep doing more. And I find, um, I try to just say, is there an easier way? What's the most simple way of doing this, Jen, rather than, you know, overthinking it. And when I try to, when I find, when I figure out that this most simplest bare bones way of doing it, then I'm like, well, then just do it that way for now. And then just get, it's very similar in tech development. We always kind of want to develop an MVP, which is like a minimum viable product. Just go for the minimum, hit it, and then carry on. And so it's just get there and don't overstress it. But that's a good question, actually. <laughs> I hope I answered it. That's I think so, I think so for sure. Okay. So number three, tell me about a way that you overcame a failure or a mistake and what you learned from it. Hmm. I'm trying to think it's probably would be, um, in my old uh, corporate job, I made the mistake of, <laughs> it's kind of funny, of not of not being on the good side of a pretty high up female VP. <laughs> I think I was intimidating a little bit and I um, kind of said some words about her that I, that I definitely, and I kind of got around to the, to the couple of office things. I didn't respect her to be honest. And, um, and it definitely got back to me. My, my boss had to have a chat with me and, and we had a very like interesting dialogue about it, but 
looking back, I was very ashamed. I was very guilty. I felt really bad. But at the same time, what I said was not disrespectful. It was just very truthful <laughs> about how she handled the situation. And it wasn't what well, it was very poorly handled. And I think now that I'm not in corporate and I look back on that, um, I was just being very honest at the time. And I think in corporate, it wasn't accepted to be honest. And I felt bad about being honest about how my, my opinion was. And I, I think how I now I view my team is I'm like, guys, I accept all feedback and I don't want anybody talking bad about each other. I just want us to have an open, honest dialogue because I care about you, how you feel. Your, your job's on a jeopardy if you say something or if you're disrespectful, like whatever, just tell me the feedback. Um, because I think that fear that's instilled in, the, in that corporate job, it really hampered my, my skill set and who I really was because I was always fearful of if I said something the wrong way, if I, if I wasn't as diplomatic enough, it could be perceived a certain way. And I just stopped being myself. And now that I run my own company. I'm just like, no, that's not the case. Honesty is the best way possible. And, um, I, I just, I learned from that the tough way, but in a, in a good way, I think in the future. Um, yeah, I think that would be one that was like, definitely was a tough one <laughs> to swallow. I think that is such a good lesson and that it's like leading you to create like a, a culture in your workplace that is not like that at all. And I think yeah. it's awesome. You don't need to be, you don't need to be diplomatic with me. I'm, I'm a very straightforward person. And I've learned that, um, although it's intimidating sometimes to be speaking with a female, maybe who's straightforward and blunt and honest and direct, it's who I am. And like, it's, it's part of my, my strengths actually. And I, rather than view it as a weakness and feel like I need to be a certain array around certain superiors, I'm just like, no, we're all at the same. We just have different skill set and different roles. That's it. Yeah. And someone just has a little bit more stress. <laughs> That's the owner. <laughs> That's it. Oh, man. Okay. Number four. What one trait or habit is most responsible for keeping you on track? My determination, for sure. Persistence, determination, stubbornness, maybe as well. <laughs> yeah. Right here, too. <laughs> Yeah. I love these questions because everybody answers them in a totally different way. So sometimes when I ask that question, people are like, oh, I drink tea every morning. Oh, you know what I mean? It's just, I just love the way that different people's minds yeah. think about the questions. And it's like, it's just, it's really telling about the, a person's personality with the way that they perceive these questions and like what, what it means to them when they're asked that. And like, I kind of made them purposely like a little vague okay. um, because I love just hearing the ways that different, different people respond to them. I think it's so cool. No, that is a good, that is really cool. And I think I also will build, I think a little bit would be, I think the biggest thing about me being successful as an entrepreneur is um, being open to hearing about how other people have succeeded and surrounding myself with successful people that I look up to. I'm always reading and researching and trying to find the best hacks, so to speak, that other people have um, given. And I always take the advice and go for it. I think my openness to receiving feedback is also, I think, something I've grown into. Yeah. Sure. That's funny. Drinking tea. I think if I'm at that, that standpoint, I'd be like, I think meditating has been a big shift for me over the past few years, for sure. From a focus standpoint, yeah. and putting, putting good physical activity in my life as well. Yeah. I need to do more conscious meditating instead of day, just daydreaming. I'm pretty good at the day. <laughs> Sometimes daydreaming is good, especially if you're creative. I think, you know, you need that. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know if you've ever done one of those Enneagram personality tests, yeah. Uh, yeah. but I'm a seven big surprise. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yes. What are what number are you? I think I'm an eight. I think that makes sense too. Like yeah. very like <laughs> yeah. doing this, I'm the boss kind of thing. Uh, yeah. But I do find it that as a seven where I'm like just so drawn to like new experiences and, and new ideas and new projects and hope for the future. And um, I tend to just say, like, come up with an idea and just say, let's go for it. We don't need a plan. Let's just make it happen. We'll figure it out as we go. And um, it's uh, it's one of the things that I think meditating would kind of help me to stay focused as opposed to being like, let's do all this stuff, you know, <laughs> Um, I do find myself like getting a little carried away and like going down the rabbit hole on certain 
fun ideas instead of saying, okay, this is what I want. Exactly. Yeah. I think as women, you're just, you're always multitasking. Right. And so you just kind of, and like, especially if you love new cool things, I like that too. I'm very similar that way. And so you're just excited and you're like, okay, I know I can, I'm capable of it. So like, let's just do it. (laughs) Exactly. Like who knows what's going to go wrong, but we won't know until we get there. And then we get there. Exactly. Yeah. Just time. The 24 hour thing is just really restricting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, seriously. When people tell me they're bored, I'm like, who are you? Yeah. You have time and not stuff to do. Who are, what the hell have you been doing with your life? Like, what is your hack? How do you, what do you do? <laughs> I'm like, I, I would never want to be bored. I'm like, man, every, every minute of the day, I'm like, Ooh, I could be doing this. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do it. Like who doesn't have that like intense crazy long someday I'm going to do this list. Like, I I don't even know what it's like to have time sitting there without an idea of what I could be doing with it. You know, I, I just, my mom told me when I was in kindergarten, I told her that kindergarten was boring on the first day. And she said, if you're bored, you're not trying hard enough. And it really like stuck with me. And I totally just think about that like every day of my life. Which leads me to question number five. What's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten? And what advice would you give to other people? Um, what's the best advice that I've ever gotten? Um, this might sound, I guess, a bit tacky, but I think earlier in my, my years, I didn't quite own it, but I, um, kind of just like focus, focus on your strengths, not your weaknesses. And if you can't, um, and if you have the funds, outsource the things that you, that you view as weaknesses to you. And, um, especially as a business owner, um, I try, you know, you, we wear all the hats possible and some I really suck at. And I think I try and I try and I hit my head against the wall. And, I, and then I try to remember, I'm like, this is not a core strength of mine. I, I, I can give you an outline. I can give you a visionary about it, but I'm going to outsource it. And ever since I've had that mentality of just not thinking I have to do it all, I can just play to my strengths and outsource as much as I can to other professionals. It has made my business expand 10 times quicker and faster because of that. You know, you spend a little money up front, but the shit actually gets done in the way I actually want it to, because I'm having a hiring a professional to do it, not myself. (laughs) Exactly. And, And it also like frees up all the time for you to work on your business instead of in your business, which was really clutch for me being able to grow my company at all because everything we do is handmade. I was like, I'm going to need another set of hands if I'm ever going to do anything besides make stuff. So uh, that's it. That's Releasing that control, right? Recognizing like I'm good at this and I can, I can make this and I can show somebody how to do this and I can teach and then I'm going to let them do it. And then I can go focus on something else, getting more clients, et cetera, growing. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So that's the best piece of advice you've gotten. And what advice would you give to other people? Um, what advice would I give to somebody else as like a business owner or just in general, in general, like any, any advice that you're like, man, if I could tell somebody something that would have might help them out, it would be this. Um, I'd say the biggest thing that is, I think for me is, um, creativity is so important. And I think every human being has creativity within, And it can be manifested in so many different ways. It doesn't need to be manifested in a specific artist way or a specific writing way, but everybody is creative inside. And I think um, I used to think my my creativeness was just some side hobby that I was like, oh, I'll just, you know, but it's actually been a huge benefit in my business just because of the way I think. And so I would say, take a look inward and see where your creativeness is and try to help, try to manifest it and try to use that in your day-to-day lives, in your work or whatever, because that's, that's the special thing about being human. I work with a lot of robots and a lot of different technology and that will never replace human creativity. Oh, I love it. I love it. I can't wait for that little clip to come out just as that little clip and put it out there. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, we've been having so much fun just kind of going going back for the last couple episodes and kind of recapping the five questions for about the first probably 10, 15 episodes that we did. Um, Mm -hmm. while I was working on this big job, we, we did a bunch of episodes that were kind of like this little recap and it's just been so 
heartening, like this really special reminder of how much this show can teach people and how valuable it can be to have this wealth of experience just kind of come out in these five questions at the end and just ways that people could t- get a new take on life or get a new tip or get some advice or, or learn from somebody else's experience kind of all like right at the end of learning about this, this amazing person. So um, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, it's it's so awesome. much fun to meet you. Can you tell everyone where they can find you on the interwebs? Yes, absolutely. So first off, thanks so much for having me. It's been it's such a pleasure being on here. And um, if you want to find out more about emerging tech or procurement in emerging tech, you can find me at www.chatsy, C-H-A-T-C dot A-I. That is awesome. Cool. Are you on social media too? I am. I, we are the Chatsy group um, on, I think, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. And then you can always, if you want to view my personal one, which I post a lot of, especially on LinkedIn, because that's kind of where my my realm and my world is. Um, mine's, it's Jennifer Echegary, um is my handle. And I post a lot of like fun, cool, creative things that are coming out in tech, but at the same time, a lot of personal stories as well. How I teach my kids with with what I'm learning as an entrepreneur and um, yeah. Awesome. So if he finds a good nugget in there, you never know. <laughs> cool. Well, all of those links will be in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am John Willoughby Lore, your host, my, my guest, Jennifer Etchieri. And uh, thanks for listening on the Reach the Stars podcast. We will catch you next week. Bye. Bye. A single interaction has the power to change your life forever. This is a place for the stories of those moments. Stories of pursuing dreams, overcoming tragedy and failure, of coming back to life after so much of what feels like dying, of continuing on with only a vision as a map. This is the place where those moments live on. Come sit by the fire, look up at the stars, and be forever changed too. Thank you for being with us on the Reach the Stars podcast. Our theme music is generously provided by Byro Craddock. You can find him on Bandcamp.com. Thank you to all of our current patrons, guests, and everyone else who helps make this dream a reality. We are so proud to be building this amazing community with all of you. If you love this podcast, please consider sharing with a friend, leaving a review on iTunes, and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash reach the stars. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see the videos of these conversations. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, do something cool and tell us about it.